Okay, folks, thank you for coming. Welcome to the FCCJ. My name is Tim Horniak. I'm a freelancer here. And um, today we're going to talk about the Olympics. Uh, our distinguished uh, guest today is Andrew uh, Zimbalist. He's a sports economist and he's a professor at Smith College in the United States. And he's going to talk about why it's risky, or potentially risky, to host uh, the Olympics. Uh, as you know, uh, Tokyo just uh, mar marked the uh, three years before uh, the hosting begins of the 2020 Olympics. Just last week in this room, we had the CEO of the organizing committee, uh, uh, Mr. Muto, uh, talking here. And amongst other things, he confirmed that the uh, estimated budget for the Tokyo 2020 Games was, I think, in the neighborhood of $12.6 billion. Um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that is more than double the initial uh, estimates uh, from the uh, early part of the bid. Um, I come from a city uh, called Montreal in Canada, and uh, we hosted the Olympics in 1976, uh, and it was famously, famously um, uh, under budgeted in terms of the, the estimates they made for the cost of the 1976 Olympics by one estimate were 720% off. They were wrong. They were <laughs> under the actual value by 720%. So that's very funny. It took 30 years for the city to pay off the cost of those Olympics in, in 76. And to this day, many Montrealers still call the Olympic Stadium in Montreal not the big O, as in the letter O, but O-W-E, as in owing money. So the big O Stadium in Montreal. Anyway, without further ado, um, Professor Zimbalist uh, will talk about his books, uh, and uh, one of which I've been reading, it's called Circus Maximus, and it's about uh, the cost of the Olympics and uh, the World Cup, and he's going to tell us uh, why he wrote this and other books, and uh, I'll just ask you please if you could put on your, uh, your cell phones and smartphones to uh, vibration mode so they don't make any noise while uh, Professor Zimbalist is speaking, and without further ado, the floor is his. Thank you very much, Tim, and, and thanks so much for <laughs> thanks for inviting me. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, I've traveled to Japan and I've taught I've taught in uh, at Doshisha University in in Kyoto. This is one of my favorite countries to to visit in the whole world. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, <clears throat> I have been doing work uh, really since uh, 2004 and 2005 on the economics of the Olympics. One of the things that has always been present around uh, Olympic publicity is this idea that the IOC puts out there, which is that hosting the Olympics is a wonderful thing for a country economically. Uh, the kinds of claims that you hear every four years are things like what um, uh, the, the chairman, Sebastian Coe, said, he was the chairman of the, the London Organizing Committee, he said London 2012 was a once-in-a-generation opportunity to showcase everything that makes Britain great uh, in order to generate long-term economic benefits. Uh, there was a study done by Ernst & Young and the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, prior to the hosting of the World Cup and the Olympics there. And that study estimated that there would be a benefit to the GDP of $100 billion, $100 billion, and it would generate 120,000 new jobs. The mayor of the former mayor of Montreal uh, once, once said, he said this before Montreal hosted in 1976, quote, the Olympics can no more have a deficit than a man can have a baby. Um, and as Tim just told you, that particular Olympic Games in 1976 ran over budget by nine, more than nine times. So you, you have, I think, the, the public dialogue around the Olympics, at least historically, being dominated by IOC propaganda. Uh, and the same kinds of claims are heard over and over again. And uh, Thomas Bach and before him Jacques Roga, uh, they would proclaim each Olympic Games to be the best games ever. And believe it or not, Thomas Bach, the president of the IOC, actually said that about the Rio Games. <clears throat> now the scholarly work that's been done, uh, or the academic investigations that have been carried out on the Olympics don't bear out the, the, the IOC propaganda. Uh, and one of the things that, that I think you have to start with is to acknowledge that the Olympics are really a, a very small economic event. 
even though they're a large cultural event, and even though they get shown on uh, a couple of billion television sets around the world, they're a small economic event. So that typically, in the, the recent summer games generate in total revenue somewhere between three and a half billion and five billion dollars. Uh, probably for, for Tokyo in 2020, the number will, will be about four and a half billion dollars. As a share of Tokyo's, or excuse me, as a share of Japan's GDP, gross domestic product, that's one twelfth of one percent. <laughs> so it's very hard to imagine that such a small event economically could have much of an impact one way or the other. But the studies that have been done, that econometric studies done by, by uh, academic economists, have not found that the Olympics produce any positive impulse at all to the economy. Uh, some, some studies find that, in fact, there's a negative effect. There have been one or two studies that find isolated sectoral short-term employment effects, but they go away over time. So let me try to break that down for you, provide some of the logic about why it's problematic or risky to host the Olympics. First, consider the short run, or what happens in the lead up to the games and during the, the 17 days of the games themselves. In order to uh, just enter the competition to host the Olympics and go through a period of at least two years where you're constantly going to IOC meetings, you're receiving IOC uh, dignitaries, uh, you're, you're hiring architects, you're hiring staff people, uh, you're, you're engaging in a variety of activities in your community. The cost just to be in the competition to bid is somewhere typically between 60 and 100 million dollars for the host. Now you often hear claims that one of the great advantages of hosting the Olympics is that there's a lot of construction that goes on. You have to build new stadiums and you have to build new roads and infrastructure and so new hotels. And all of that construction means jobs and that's good for the local economy. You also hear the claim that there's a boost to tourism because of the publicity impact of hosting the games. Um, those, those two claims are not borne out empirically. Let me, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And then I want to talk to you about the experience that Montreal and so many other places have had about cost overruns and what the financial balance is at the end of the, uh, the Olympic Games. So the idea that there's this wonderful construction impact, um, it turns out to be not borne out. And why is it not borne out? The reason it's not borne out is because when you do the amount of construction that the Olympics requires, and it does require an enormous amount of construction, these days, to host the summer games, you have to build or have 35 sports venues. You have to build an Olympic village that costs somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three billion dollars. You have to build a media village. Uh, you have to build an international broadcasting uh, and media center. You have to do a lot of infrastructural work in telecommunications and transportation and hospitality. So there's an enormous amount of building. Why is that not good for a local economy? Well. The first thing that you have to be concerned about is what the state of the local economy is during the seven years of buildup, right? You get, you get chosen as the Olympic host seven years before you actually host the games. If the economy in your city happened to be very depressed during those seven years, well then it might be in fact the case that having all of that spending on the Olympics would be positive. But if the economy is close to full employment and you have all of that spending, what it does is not generate more jobs, but it generates more inflation. Now the other thing that happens very often because the large amount of construction that goes on is the local construction workforce is not sufficient in numbers to do all the work. And so you end up inevitably importing workers from other cities in the country and from other countries altogether. So the local benefit for employment is not likely to be very large. Uh, th there's also the benefit, uh, excuse me, the claimed benefit of tourism from all of the publicity. Well, here the, the story is, is uh, perhaps a little bit more complex, but it's very different than the notion that there's an unalloyed benefit to the local community. Why is that? Well. <clears throat> If you look at the data, you know that in Beijing, when they hosted the games in 2008, according to the official statistics from the government, tourism went down 30% during the summer of 2008. In London, tourism went down 6%. In many other countries, tourism did not increase during the summer months of hosting the game or the winter months if, during the case of the Winter Olympics. Why is that? The reason primarily 
is that the Olympic tourists replace the normal tourists. And the normal tourists take a look at the city and they say, I don't want to go there when all of the Olympic tourists are going to be there. It's going to, there's going to be a lot of congestion. There might be security incidents. It's more dangerous to go during the Olympics. And prices are going to be higher, higher at the hotels and in the restaurants. So the normal tourists stay away and they're displaced by the Olympic tourists. That's not a good thing for tourism. Why is it not a good thing for tourism? Because the main way, and this is, if, if, you, if you go to the, the tour operators associations around the world, they'll all attest to this. The best way to promote tourism in a country is word of mouth. It's when you go and you visit another country and you've had good experiences at the museums, you've had good experiences at the theater, you've had good experiences at the ballpark, you've had good meals in the restaurants, and you had a good hotel. You go home and you talk to your friends, neighbors, and relatives, and you tell them about your wonderful experience as a tourist in such and such a city. But if you go to a city to watch the Olympics, you go home and you talk about the swimming medley that you saw, or the 100 meter dash that you saw, or the tennis matches that you saw, or downhill skiing event. You're not talking about the city. Your friends, neighbors, and relatives can't go back to that city and watch the Olympics like you did, because the Olympics won't be coming back. So the word of mouth effect uh, is, is actually diminished, uh, which hurts, uh, which can very well hurt the uh, tourism in the future. <coughs> So again, Tim mentioned the, the cost overruns in Montreal. In fact, the University of Oxford uh, did a study, they've done two studies now, where they found that if you looked at all of the Olympic Games from 1960 to the present, for which we have adequate data, that every single one of them has had a cost overrun. And when you look at the games since 1980, so this actually excludes uh, ex excludes Montreal, but if you look at the games since 1980, the summer games, they've had on average a 252 percent cost overrun, which means that it's the final budget, the final cost is 3.5 times what the initial budget was. So in the case of London, the initial budget was 5 billion, the final expenditure was over 18 billion. In the case of Sochi, the Winter Olympics in 2014, the budget was 12 billion. The final expenditure is hard to know because we don't always get the, the, the correct and ac most accurate story from Mr. Putin, but somewhere between 51 billion and 65 billion was a cost in Sochi. In Rio, there was a budget initially of 6.5 billion, ended up costing 20 billion plus. So how can we understand this? Why is it the case time and time again that the Olympics have, have, or hosting the Olympics have these massive cost overruns. Well, the first thing is that you find invariably is that the, the individuals who are involved from the host city who are trying to convince the political bodies to approve of the Olympics always lowball their initial estimate. Once they get political approvement, then they start adding the bells and whistles, and the price goes higher and higher. So there's an intentional effort to underestimate the cost to get political support. <clears throat> Another reason why there are cost overruns is that, as I just said, you get awarded the Olympics seven years before you actually host the games. And two or three years before you get awarded the games, you're in a competition, sometimes first with cities in your own country, and then with cities around the world. So you have basically a nine or a 10 year period, and it's very hard to estimate costs due to all sorts of things over a nine or 10 year period. So that's one of the issues that creates a cost overrun. Another issue is that when you host the Olympics, you have a firm deadline. Firm deadlines don't apply all around the world all the time. Usually they don't apply. You have a contract, and the contract says you're supposed to have a commercial building ready for occupancy October of 2017, or it specifies some other month. But if you don't have it ready on October 17th, 2017, maybe you have it ready in November, or you have it ready in, 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 in December or the following January, and not much happens around that. You simply put out a notice to the people who are going to occupy that they're going to have to wait for another month or two. It's okay for that to happen. It's common for that to happen. That can't happen with the Olympics. The Olympics in Tokyo are going to be begin on July 24th, uh, 2020. And you can't simply call up Thomas Bach and say, sorry, the Olympic Stadium is not going to be ready until uh, you know, August 4th. That doesn't work. So there's a firm deadline. So when you, go to a, when you go to a construction company or a developer and you say, look, come hell or high water, it's got to be ready on this day, then the developer or, or the construction company says, well, in that case, I have to prioritize my resources and my materials. 
to this project in a way that I don't for other projects. And in prioritizing them, I'm going to have to pay them more. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to charge you more. So that's another problem that happens. Still another problem is that because of the enormity of the construction that goes on, which I referred to earlier, Inevitably, whether you're a developed and an efficient country or whether you're a less developed and less efficient country, inevitably, you're rushing at the end of the game. You're rushing to get everything ready at the right time. And when you have to rush, you typically bypass normal bidding procedures. And instead of having competitive bidding for the projects, you start getting backroom deals that are made. And that, of course, leads to payoffs and all sorts of other problems. Now, some countries are fall uh, prey to that more than others, uh, but pretty much everybody has that, those dimensions of a problem when they host the games. So all those things come together and, and end up uh, jacking the price well up from the initial bid. <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about how, how you measure the costs and what, what the different areas of expenditure are. <clears throat> Tim mentioned uh, that you, you had the CFO from, from the Tokyo 2020 games here um, a, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> and I guess he said he, last week. last week, and I guess he said that the, the current estimate was $12.6 billion. Let me tell you, as somebody who's only read about the Tokyo 2020 games, I have not, uh, have not done my own independent research on this, but I've been reading about it steadily over the last the six months or so, that when I read an article about the estimated cost of the games back in December of 2016, the estimated cost of the games was between 14 and $15.6 billion. And the last estimate that came out is this $12.6 billion estimate. It came out in June of this year. Where did that money go? For? How, did, how did they end up saving $2.5 billion? Well, according to an article I read, the, the way they saved $2.5 billion is they took the contingency fund of $2.8 billion out of the budget. They simply removed it. So one of, the, one of the things that you have to realize about Olympic accounting is that it's very fungible. It's very manipulatable. Uh, people can make the, the budget go way up or they can make it go way down by deciding what they're going to include in the budget. Now, it's, it's the reason why they had that contingency fund in there is precisely because of what we were just talking about, that you have cost overruns all the time. And if you only budget for 12 but you end up spending 15, then you're in fiscal distress. And if you're using some public money, then either the city of Tokyo or the national government or some other government body is in distress. And they have to borrow the money or they have to raise taxes. Uh, and that creates all sorts of political problems. In the case of Beijing, which hosted the, the summer games, as you know, in 2008, and they're going to host the winter games two years after the Tokyo 2020, um, they decided that the roughly five to seven billion dollars of expense that they are undertaking in order to build high-speed rails from Beijing up to the two locations by the Gobi Desert in the north where they're going to have cross-country skiing and downhill skiing, uh, that the expenditure for those high-speed rails is not going to be in the Olympic budget. Why is it not going to be in the Olympic budget? They say because they were going to build them anyway. Well, it's not very likely that you'd be, build high-speed rails to remote locations um, that don't have adequate rainfall uh, during the course of the year. Uh, but that's what they're doing. And so it, simply that five or seven billion dollars disappears from the Olympic budget. So there's a lot of finagling that goes on. Basically, an, an Olympic budget has, has three or four buckets. One of the buckets is, is an operations bucket. By the way, so I'm supposed to stop at, at one, right? Well, yeah, but we can, okay. we can keep give or take. a little bit. Give sure. or take. Yeah. Okay. Um, so an operations budget. That's the cost of operating the games for 17 days while the, day, while the games are going on. Boston, which had uh, applied to be one of the, the hosts for the 2024 Summer Games, uh, they had an operating budget estimate of $4.7 billion. And that's where most, most host cities come in. Four and a half, four, five billion dollars. That's the operating budget. Then you have another budget for building the permanent sports venues. In the case of Tokyo 2020, 40 percent of the venues that will be used will be new, they, freshly built. In the case of uh, at Los Angeles, which will get the games for 2028, they don't have to build anything. Uh, the, 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 the permanent sports venue budget in the case of Boston was 3.4 billion dollars. Then there's an infrastructure budget. 
And typically, cities have to build roads, they have to build parking lots, they have to build uh, power lines, they have to build telecommunications facilities, they have a hospitality infrastructure. There's a hospital, excuse me, there's an infrastructure budget, which is the third bucket, uh, that goes anywhere from three or four or five billion dollars up to, in the case of Sochi, 30 or Beijing, 30 or 40 billion dollars. And the Boston budget, the proposed budget for Boston, that was actually in the budget, they were saying it was going to cost $5.2 billion. But the head of the state legislature in the Transportation Committee said it would cost at least $13 billion. So again, it's a matter of making up whatever number you want and throwing it into the budget. Then there's another bucket, which is security. In the case of Rio, last summer, they had 85,000 troops on the streets surrounding all of the Olympic venues to protect, to protect the, the, the security and the safety of the tourists and the athletes and the, the IOC membership that was, that was at the games, 85,000 troops. They also had large tanks. Uh, they, they had all sorts of military equipment all over the city. And it cost them around $2 billion to implement the necessary security measures uh, for the games. They were concentrating the police around the Olympic venues, which meant that the other areas of Rio didn't have security. And so crime went up uh, for the people who were living in, in the rest of Rio de Janeiro uh, enormously during the games and after the games. So you have at least four buckets that account for the different, different costs. Now another thing that invariably happens is that cities will talk about how they're going to invest in or how they're going to develop private public partnerships so that a, a good part of the final bill won't fall on the city, but will rather be covered by private investment. One of the things that you have to realize is that in order to get a private investor to put his or her money into Olympic venues or into Olympic infrastructure, you have to induce them to do that. Because obviously, if, if a stadium hadn't been built prior to the Olympics, then nobody thought it was a good investment to make. And if, if a hotel hadn't been built prior to the Olympics, nobody thought it was a good investment to make. So how do you convince the private sector to make investments that until that point in time, they didn't think were good investments? The way you convince them is you give them free land, you give them uh, tax write-offs, you give them uh, tax holidays on property taxes, you give them low interest loans, you give them other inducements to make it worth their while. And so even though you, you might find that, that the Olympic Committee tells you, okay, 60 or 70 or some other percent is private money, there's really public money hidden there because the public is not going to be taking in the taxes that it would otherwise take in. And not be and have to having to give out more revenue than would otherwise give out. I have some. I was going to give you some more detailed examples of that in the case of Boston, but I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to do that. Now, another thing that that I think is important to realize, and this particularly I think would apply to a place like like Tokyo, is that there are what economists call opportunity costs, not out of pocket cash costs, but opportunity costs for doing all of the work that you do uh, for the Olympics. Uh, Beijing used up over 8,000 acres of land in 2008 for Olympic venues and Olympic infrastructure. 8,000 acres of land. Those are acres of land that could have had other uses besides Olympic venues and Olympic in infrastructure. Uh, maybe commercial use, maybe retail use, maybe residential use, maybe recreational use, but land is valuable. Land is in scarce supply. People in Tokyo know that as well as anybody. So when you start building things for the Olympics, you're using land for one purpose rather than another. There's an implied cost there. Another cost is that the IOC requires that the city doesn't tax any Olympic activities. So when you normally, uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know all the details about, about uh, Japanese tax policy, but normally a country will have tariffs on imported materials for construction goods. The IOC doesn't allow you to charge those tariffs. Uh, the IOC doesn't allow you to, to in, have income taxes on the, the money that's earned by the broadcasters or by the athletes from the Olympic Games. So there are various losses of tax revenue from that. The IOC also requires that all of the signage, all of the advertising outdoors in the city, in the host city, be turned over to the IOC. 
And that means usually a lot of advertising space is controlled by the city. Uh, they, they, lent, they rent it out to different companies who are promoting their companies and their products. You can't do that during the Olympics because those billboards and th that electronic signage area is going to be used by the IOC sponsors uh, for, their, for their purposes. So summing it all up, uh, it, the, the average experience in the recent games has been in the developed countries that have hosted the games, the summer games, uh, a total cost in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 billion dollars and total revenue, as I mentioned before, in the neighborhood of three and a half to five billion dollars. For developing countries like China, like, like Russia, like Brazil, uh, the costs are going to be a lot higher because they have much more infrastructure to take care of. So all of that has to do with the short run. What about the long run? The IOC would argue to you, Thomas Bach would argue to you, that uh, even, even if there's a short-term loss, there's a long-term gain. And the long-term gain takes the form of all of the publicity advantages that you derive from hosting the games and being on a few billion television sets around the world. So they say, because of that publicity, you'll get more tourism, you'll get more foreign investment, you'll get more trade. <coughs> And they say, usually they make the claim that there'll be improved fitness for your population, which will lower your health costs. Well, empirically, those, those arguments are not borne out. It's just, that's the simplest thing to say. They're just not borne out. Um, tourism doesn't grow, in there, with, with the exception of Barcelona. Uh, tourism has not gotten a boost from other Olympic hosts for the reasons that I outlined earlier. Uh, foreign investment has not gotten a boost. London made an extravagant claim. Uh, they, they held a, a, a luncheon for 16 international businesses a month before hosting the games in 2012. They came out of the luncheon and said that they had a commitment from those 16 businesses of billions of dollars of new investment. That was a propaganda luncheon, because if you look at the official statistics for London, actually foreign investment after 2012 went down. And it went down appreciably if you compare it to, to earlier years before the, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, sim simply put, any business worth its salt isn't going to invest in a city because they hosted the Olympics. The businesses invest in areas because the areas have the natural resources they need, they have a local market that they want to take advantage of. Uh, they have skilled labor force that they need for their production. Uh, that they have certain amenities that make it attractive to live in the city. That's why businesses invest in areas. Um, they don't invest in areas because they hosted the Olympic Games. Now, another, th another outcome of hosting the Olympics, inevitably, is that you have white elephants. I'm skipping over some stuff rather quickly. Um, you have white elephants. So white elephants are are facilities that you build for the Olympics that either aren't used at all going forward or they're used very, very infrequently. And, and you can't justify the cost of even maintaining those facilities uh, because they're used so infrequently. So you have the, 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 uh, the bird's nest in Beijing. Uh, in, in Rio, you have virtually everything that they built for the Rio games in, 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 20, uh, in 2016. Uh, it, th th these are things that are lying idle. Something like 75% of the facilities that were built for Athens in 2004 lying idle. If you, if you reflect on the whole process, what you see is that cities for the Olympics are building things that they didn't have before the Olympics. Why didn't they have them before the Olympics? Because there wasn't sufficient demand to maintain those facilities in an economic fashion. Just because you host the Olympics, people in your country aren't all of a sudden, like in Rio, they built a golf course. In Rio, prior to the Olympics, they had two country clubs. Both of those country clubs had a very low level of play. There was very low interest in golf in Brazil and in Rio. They built a third golf course. They, bu they built it in an environmentally protected area in a marshland. Uh, they destroyed the ecology in that area. Uh, and they thought that by having all of the world's best, or some of the world's best golfers play, that all of a sudden Brazilians would want to play golf. They were wrong. There was no demand for using that golf course. That golf course is now is lying, is lying idle. And that's a similar problem that happens whenever you host the Olympic Games. You don't create demand by 17 days of activity. There's also this expectation, or claim anyway, that when your population sees the best athletes of the world, 
performing before their own eyes live, that that will motivate them to engage in more fitness activity. That's an interesting claim. Uh, but you might, you might as well make the claim that w when the Olympics are in your, in your city and in your country, that more of your local residents will watch the games on television because they won't be able to afford the tickets. And watching the games on television might encourage them to become couch potatoes <laughs> rather than becoming, become athletes who are, are more fit. And in fact, once again, the, the, the independent studies have found that fitness does not Im improve after you host the Olympic Games. Uh, so one thing after another uh, leads one, I think, to uh, be extremely skeptical about, uh, about the claims that are made for, for long-run benefits as well. Is, are, is there any good news from hosting the Olympics? Well, a lot of cities experience a, a certain spirit, an elan, an excitement, a sense of pride from hosting the Games. It does happen. Uh, it's, it's certainly happened in, in several cities. It certainly happened in Vancouver. It happened in Calgary in the Winter Olympics in 1988. Uh, hopefully it'll happen in Tokyo. It's one of the things that uh, can give, give local residents some pleasure. The problem is that, number one, it doesn't always happen. It didn't, certainly didn't happen in Rio. Uh, it didn't happen in, in Munich in 1972 when the Israeli compound was raided by terrorists. It didn't happen in Mexico in 1968 for a variety of, it doesn't happen in a lot of places. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it does. When it does happen, it's short-lived, it's ephemeral. It's nothing that hangs around for a long period of time. It's probably not something that most people would be willing to spend $20 billion in order to have that month of, of excitement. Another thing that the Olympics can do is, because of the urgency of producing the games, because of the uh, necessity of having all of the venues ready on time, that sometimes cities are able to bypass political gridlock and maybe learn some political lessons from that. Uh, I, 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 I think that that's, that's a reality. Um, the, the problem I see with that line of reasoning, though, is that if a city is going to host the Olympics once every 50 years, Tokyo last hosted it in 1964, so it's al almost uh, uh, it's, it's 60 years, roughly, uh, 56 years. Paris will get the Olympics in 2024. They last hosted them in 1924, so it's 100 years for Paris. If you're going to host the Olympics every 50 years or every 100 years, you better not rely on hosting the Olympics to solve your political problems. You better work on the political gridlock independently of hosting the Games. Um, I don't have time to talk about, I think there are two stories, uh, both in Barcelona in, in 1992 and, and Los Angeles in 1984. I think arguably those are success stories. They were under very special conditions, and I'll be happy, happy to come back and, and, and talk to you about that uh, in, in more detail. But I think that the, at, at the end of the day, the, the best way to have a good experience with, with hosting the Olympics is to not host them. Uh, and if you are, and, and if you are going to host the Olympics, then, then what's really necessary is to do what, in fact, Barcelona did, and not do what virtually every other city does. What the typical pattern is, is a city wins the bid to host the Olympics, and the IOC comes in and they say, we need these 35 venues, we need this Olympic Village, we need this International Broadcasting Center, we need so many acres of ceremonial green space, and we need X, Y, and Z. And then the city goes through contortions, uh, twisting its body and twisting and, and, and turning in order to accommodate the IOC. Sure, the politicians will say, oh, well, we integrated this with our planning and, and we're meeting certain needs of ours. Uh, and probably sometimes they are. They're spending $20 billion and maybe they get $2 billion of worthwhile infrastructure. What happened in Barcelona was distinct from that. What happened in Barcelona is that after Franco was gone in 1975, and, and democracy was reintroduced nationally and locally, is that the citizens of, of Barcelona and, and in the Catalan area of Spain laid out a plan for how they wanted their area to develop. It's something that had been ignored or overlooked by, by Franco. Did I say Castro a minute ago? No. I said Franco, good, okay. Uh, that had been overlooked during the, the uh, 30 years of, or 40 years of Franco. Uh, and so they laid out a plan for their city. And the major part of the plan was to op open the city to the sea again because what had sprung up during the 40 years of Franco was a uh, manufacturing belt and a warehousing belt that separated the main blocks of the city from the Mediterranean. 
And they developed a plan that was going to undo that and create new, new roadways that was going to make it easier to travel around the city. So they had a plan in place. And with that plan in place, they got the idea that they could meet the IOC requirements in a way that wouldn't alter that plan at all and, in fact, would accelerate the implementation of the plan. So in Barcelona, the plan came first and the Olympics was fit into the plan rather than there being no plan and the IOC coming first and then the city fitting itself into the, the IOC's uh, demands. So I think there, there are ways to, to deal with this issue, to deal with the challenge. Uh, they, they have to do, though, with a completely new gestalt. Uh, they have to do with a more fundamental reform. And it's hard to reform an institution like the IOC because, after all, the International Olympic Committee is an international monopoly. It produces a product that's very, very popular. There is no international regulatory body that tells it what it can do and what it can't do. And there's no antitrust action that breaks it up. So cities have to deal with this on their own, with their own resources and their own politics. And I think that the, you know, the situation, although I have not studied it in detail, the situation that presents itself to Tokyo 2020 is every bit as challenging as it has been for other recent Olympic hosts. Thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zimbalist. Very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, right now we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, we'll go with the working press first. I'm going to ask you to uh, state your name and your affiliation. And please, no speeches, no long stories. Let's keep it brief so uh, other uh, people can ask questions. Do we have any questions to begin? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I'll have a question. Yes, Mary? Okay, why don't you? Sure, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Mary Corbett, Crescent Media. I wrote quite extensively about the 1964 Olympics, which uh, you might already know were held in October. Uh, because it was too hot. Uh, now we are suffering record temperatures in July that are now almost exceeding average August temperatures on many days. Uh, I also write a lot about um, sports and medicine, and a lot of the hospitals I talk to are already standing by. They're basically trying to project what they're going to need during that month. The Paralympics, I think the equipment, the wheelchairs are heat traps. and. Nobody knows how these athletes are going to be protected, but also the millions of people that are going to be watching track and field and who are going to be lining the marathon course. Um, you talked about the possible positive effects to public health, but I was wondering is if anybody has put a cost on this absolute heat, you know, heat nightmare we're going to have. Right. So. Uh, First comment is, I don't believe you're old enough to have covered the 1964 <laughs> Summer Olympics. Um, look, there, there's, I, I skipped over a lot of material because I didn't have enough time, but there, there are very serious and extensive human costs involved in hosting the games. In Atlanta, 19, uh, 1996 Summer Olympics, they evicted, they, they, they tore down two low-income communities that were primarily African Americans and, and Latinos. So they evicted 4,000 people from their homes. In Seoul, uh, the Seoul Summer Olympics, uh, reports suggest that they evicted over 500,000 people from their homes. In Beijing, in 2008, they evicted over 1.5 million people from their homes. In Rio this past summer, uh, they evicted 77,200 favelados, people who live in, in the shanty towns or favelas, from their homes. Um, there are untold, I, I mentioned one example of, of the golf course in Rio, but there are untold environmental disasters that happen. Uh, and then there's also a potential problem with the weather. Now, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you that it gets, gets warm and humid. Uh, in, in Tokyo, and it, it can be, I think, a very serious problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, it will, it will potentially um, crowd, crowd the hospitals. Uh, they won't be able to attend to everybody properly. Uh, it will diminish the amount of, of uh, access to hospitals that local residents can have. Uh, and, you know, who, who actually knows what, what, what can happen? But um, it's not going to happen in October. We know that. It's going to start on July 24th. And, and that makes it all the, all the more 
scary, I think. One, you know, one of the things that the IOC is thinking about with the Olympics, one of the major things they're thinking about is its presentation to the world community. Uh, they want there to be nice images on international television. And they want to make NBC and all of the other broadcasters around the world happy. And NBC has a schedule. And they don't want to put on the Olympics in the fall because the fall is when they put on their, their, their new shows. Uh, NBC would spend much less money or give the IOC much, le much, much less money if they put them on in October. Um, the, IOC, the NBC does have in their schedule time between July 24th and roughly August 10th or August 11th. So that's what determines how these things get done. And it doesn't get determined on the basis of what makes sense for the athletes or what makes sense for the, the tourists who come or what makes sense for the residents of Tokyo. Yeah, you, want, you have a follow-up question? Just a quick one. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things, for example, I think in Athens, same problem, same average temperatures as Tokyo. They decided to run it. No, the humidity was much lower. And that's the problem. The humidity is sky high in Tokyo. Yeah. And athletes don't complain three years in advance because A, they want to make the Olympic team, they don't want to make noise, right? But closer to the racing day, for example, can the athletic union say, no, we're not going to run under these conditions, period. But maybe we have to do it at midnight. But the humidity is high at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> but, but is that one way that a city can say no to NBC or the other way? Well, one of the interesting things is that um, because of the experience that Olympic hosts have had, really since the year 2000, which is these ballooning costs with revenues way, way below the costs, is that fewer and fewer cities want to host the games, right? So for the, the, uh, the 2022 Winter Olympics, at one point in time, you had Beijing and Almaty, Kazakhstan, and you also had five European cities that were in the bidding. And all five of the European cities during 2014 dropped out. They said, we don't want it. It's, this doesn't make sense for us. For the 2024 Summer Olympics, you had dropping out. At the end, right now, we still have Los Angeles and, uh, and Paris, right? But before that, we had Boston was involved, Toronto was involved, Budapest was involved, Rome was involved, and um, Hamburg was involved. They all dropped out. So the IOC has a problem. The problem is that the games have gotten out of control. And th their historical model, which was to get cities of the world to bid against each other, and, and by, com by competing against each other, bid up, bidding up the cost every time. Because the city, each city would say, oh, we can do it better than that city. Our Olympic Stadium will hold 90,000 instead of 80,000, or whatever the, the, the gambit was at the time. Um, that model is not working. And so the, the IOC, back in December of 2014, passed a reform package that they refer to as, as Agenda 2020. Uh, and that reform package highlighted three, three goals that they said that they were going to implement. One was that they were going to make the Olympics uh, more sustainable, environmentally sustainable. Uh, number two was that they were going to simplify the bidding process. And number three was that they were going to make it more economically sustainable, so cities would, would find it more attractive to host the games. Now, interestingly, I don't know if people were following this, but John Coates, who is the, the vice president below, below Thomas Bach of the IOC, uh, he, was, he was in Tokyo about a month ago, maybe, maybe six, six weeks ago, um, and, and he, he said, look, you guys have to lower your costs. And remember, the initial bid in Tokyo was about $5.6 billion, and now they're claiming it's, it's $12.6 billion, or $15 billion if you include the contingency budget. Um, but you know, remember that the, the, the governor of, of Tokyo commissioned a study back in December, I think it was last December, and that, that study, the task force, said that the, the games were likely to cost $27.1 billion. Uh, the IOC comes along and they say, wait a minute, you guys can't spend $27 billion. That's terrible PR for us. <laughs> we're, trying to we're trying to convince the world that this is economically sustainable. Uh, and he, he said it again six weeks ago. He said $15 billion is too low. You've got to keep driving the cost down. And why did he say that? He didn't say he wanted to do that so that taxpayers in Tokyo uh, would have a lower burden. He said we have to do that to make the IOC more popular. Um, so the IOC is, is aware that it has a problem. It's trying to implement reforms, um, but nothing profound has happened. All of the reforms, in my view, 
have been superficial. They've been on the surface. Okay, let's go to another question. I think Daryl uh, in the back had his uh, hand up before. Yeah, uh, Daryl Gibson, freelance. Um, oh, sure. I don't want to sound like an apologist for the IOC, um, but I know that they have um, the idea or they love to think that places like Seoul and Beijing and Tokyo in 64, et cetera, et cetera, all blossomed after the games. And as someone who doesn't know Tokyo in 64 but knew Seoul in, well before 88 and Beijing well before 2008, there's no doubt been a change in South Korea and in um, China, uh, particularly in Beijing, I'm not ready to say that that was because they had the Olympics, but it doesn't seem, you know, it, it, if you do a very strict cost-benefit analysis, it doesn't look like those were very great things, and yet now, what, 20, 25 years later, um, South Korea is nothing like South Korea was before 88, despite the fact 700,000 people got bulldozed. Yeah, so thanks, so that's a good question. Um, I, I think in a way you, you already provided my answer to it embedded in your question. The, the, the issue is that if you go back to Tokyo in 1964, you go back to Seoul in, in the late 1980s, um, you, you're, took, you're talking about two societies that are ra rapidly, rapidly developing. Uh, so very high invest, investment ratios, annual growth rates, double-digit annual growth rates. Um, and in the middle of those periods, you stick in Olympic Games. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sure that the, the publicists from the IOC say, aha, look, uh, look at the, the country continued to develop. When, when, when economists try to, to untangle the mystery there, uh, or the, the confusion there, what, you, what we do is something called econometrics. We do, uh, put it simply, a regression analysis, uh, where we look at things like employment and, and output, and we look at all of, the, all of the variables that can change employment and output. Uh, so there's, an, there's a literature on economic growth that says that, you know, one of the major things that makes an economy grow fast is a very high investment ratio. And so you look at that and you look at a bunch of other things. Uh, and then you, you introduce a variable for the Olympics. And you try to see if the variable of the Olympics has a distinguishable impact from all the other stuff that's going on. And the, what I'm telling you is that the econometric studies have found that it doesn't, basically. Um, so it's, you know, it, there's, always, there's always an issue of causality. What's, what's making what happen? But so I think part, part of my answer is that you have to go and you have to look at the empirical evidence, the econometric studies, but part of it is to try to understand the logic of, of how, how can it be the case that when you, when you build, back, back in 1964, the amount of building was much, much lower than it is today. But whatever it was, whether you're building 35 venues or 20 venues, how can it be the case that, that building a velodrome uh, and building an extra aquatic center uh, and, and building a bunch, a bunch of um, uh, international broadcasting center outlets. How can it be the case that, that those investments are going to promote development in a country? Uh, why, why would they promote development in a country? Why were they appropriate investments for a country to make that didn't need those before they hosted the Olympic Games? And I, I think that if you work through the logic, it's very hard. It's very hard to come to the conclusion that hosting a party, posting a party for 17 days that cost $20 billion is a productive thing for for countries' development. Now, as I said before, if you're investing 15 or 20 billion dollars, it's probably going to be the case that you end up building a road, and you end up building a bridge or a tunnel, and you end up building a few other things that are productive for the country. Um, but if you look at the longer scheme here, wh why is it a good investment to invest 20 billion dollars to get an output of 2 billion dollars that's worthwhile? It's not. You're, you're wasting resources. Um, so I, I, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a real good question. It's always hard to, uh, to, to separate, separate out cause and effect here. But I, I just don't think that the, the evidence would, would end up supporting those arguments. OK, I think we had a question in the back, George, uh, and then we'll go to you, Andy. Uh, 
My name is Baumgartner. I'm working for Swiss Television. You, you, you didn't mention the incestuous relationship between the media and the, and the IOC and the organizers of, uh, of the games. Uh, the, the Nagano Olympic Games were among the, the most expensive and corrupt games in the history. Uh, of the games and, and, and Tokyo managed to convince their own people to, to, to get the games in, in, in uh, 2020. There are also accusations of kickbacks. They, they bought the games. Uh, they, uh, the, but the investigations regarding the Tokyo Olympic Games is made by, the, uh, by some prosecutors in Paris. <coughs> Nothing here. And when uh, Mr. Muto, the, uh, the head of the Olympic Comite Committee, came to the press club a few days ago, the, nobody asked any hard questions regarding the budget, nothing. So what do you think about this incestuous relationship with the media? And how is it possible to, to break the monopoly of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, IOC when your, your, your kind of voices is not heard uh, enough? Uh, so I haven't studied the relationship between the media and the IOC. I've read about it. Um, I'm not sure I, could, I can enlighten uh, everybody here about what that relationship is like. One of the things that I know from friends of mine who are journalists uh, is that they get treated very nicely by the IOC <laughs> when, when they're covering the games. Uh, and I, you know, what that tends to do is, is, is produce a very um, open and supportive press towards the IOC. But there's still obviously a lot of independent journalists out there who are doing good, good critical journalism. Um, in, in terms of breaking the, the, uh, the IOC monopoly, I, I don't think it's easy. You know, uh, Ted Turner tried to break it. He created something called the Goodwill Games back in, back in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, and he failed. The IOC and the Olympics is a very, very, very popular and strong brand. And it's, it's not going to be easy for anybody to break that. And it's impossible to regulate it. We don't have a world government that's going to stand over the IOC and regulate it and tell it what it can do and what it can't do. Um, one of the things that I think one of the levers that, that exists out there is the sponsors. There's a lot, a lot of the revenue the IOC collects is from government, government, excuse me, corporate sponsorships. Uh, for any Olympic Games, they collect these days over a billion dollars of corporate sponsorships. Corporations are only interested in sponsoring and attaching their name to the Olympics when the Olympics is viewed as a good thing. Uh, but if the Olympics starts being associated with th things that happen in Rio, rather than things that happened in Barcelona, um, then corporations start walking away. And a bunch of corporations have walked away. A lot of corporations walked away from FIFA that runs the World Cup uh, during the, the, the scandals that uh, surrounded FIFA a couple of years ago. And F FIFA had to eventually uh, change its ways a little bit. They, they have a long way to go still. But I think there, there is some, there's some power in, in the corporations because uh, they, 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 can, they can pull their investment support. And there, there's some power in, in the form of, of local communities that resist the Olympic Games. I think that, that people in Rio protested very vigorously before and during and after the Games. And I think it's, it has besmirched, it's tarnished the image of the IOC. And the IOC is, is going to have to entertain different models. The old model is not going to work anymore. So what, what, what might a new model be? Uh, it might be that, that, uh, that the Olympics starts doing what, uh, what the, British, the British Open in golf does. Right? They, have, they have six golf courses in Scotland that rotate to, to host the British, uh, the British Open in golf. I think six is too many, but maybe the IOC should identify one city in, in um, uh, four different continents and, and rotate the Olympics around so that you don't have to rebuild the sports Shangri-La every four years in a, in, a, in a new city. So that's one possible model. Another possible model is the IOC. I don't think the IOC will do this on its own. Somebody, some outside forces will have to push them to do it. But another possible model would be that the IOC can issue a bond for, let's say, $70 billion and build all the Olympic facilities they need, let's say, somewhere between Olympia and Athens and Greece. Greece doesn't have the money to do it, but if, if the Olympics 
issued the bond, raised six, six billion dollars, and then took the revenue that they get from hosting the Olympics to do debt service on the bond, they could maintain those facilities in Greece and turn them into training centers in between the four-year cycles. So that'd be another possible model. But uh, to be sure, all of that is just uh, intellectual game playing. Uh, you, you need some political power. And, and currently, I don't think there is sufficient political power to change the model. Okay, great. Let's get to uh, questions. Andy had a question. Hi there, it's um, Andy Sharp from Bloomberg. Um, so we're three years away from the start of the Olympics. If you were in a room now, I don't know if you're gonna meet them or not, but with Governor Koike or the organizing committee, what advice would you give to them, practical steps to take to, we're gonna host the games, that's a fact, it's gonna happen, but practical steps to keep a lid on the costs, to stop the thing getting out of control, steps that could be taken now rather than five years ago. So those are consulting services for which I charge a thousand dollars an hour. No, <laughs> um, it's kind of late in the game to do anything very substantial. But here's what I believe. Uh, and I and by the way, I haven't studied. I'm going to be meeting with the CFO of Tokyo 2020 on Friday, and hopefully I'll learn more about some of these details. And I, I think it's very perilous to for for an outsider to come to a, a place without knowing the details and to tell, tell the place what they should be doing. Uh, but I think as a general matter, what I believe is that Tokyo has some leverage. Um, it, it's extraordinarily unlikely that the IOC is gonna pull the bid from Tokyo at this point. It's, too, it's, just, it's too late in the game for the IOC to do that. It would be terrible public relations if they did that. So I think that, that the, the organizing committee in Tokyo has some leverage. They can basically go to the IOC and say, we want to do this and we don't want to do that, so we're not going to do that. Um, now, obviously, you know, Tokyo can at this point say, uh, we're not going to play baseball in Fukushima, or we're not going to play, uh, we're not going to have the velodrome, we're not going to have indoor biking races. They can't do that. But I, I'm sure there are all sorts of things on the margin that they can do. One of the things that the IOC requires is, is to have a certain amount of hotel beds. And I know that there's plans for investing in hotels in Tokyo. I can't for the life of me figure out why a, a, a hotel owner would want to invest in a hotel that didn't make sense before the Olympics, but they think is going to make sense after the Olympics. And there, there must be some kind of, of, of subsidy or, or sweetener involved. But so I would think that that would be something that, that, you know, that Tokyo 2020 could, could say to the IOC. Uh, they, they want to avoid the overbuilding of hotels, which happened in Sochi, which happened in Sydney, which happened in Lillehama, which happened in many places. Um, so, again, without, without knowing the details of, of, of what's being invested in right now, I, I can't go beyond that, but I, I think that they have some leverage to at least cut corners and, and save, save, save some money. And I think it's too late to do a fundamental reordering of the planning but again, if, if there are parts of the infrastructural investment that make sense for Tokyo's development, I think it's fine to do those things. If there are other things like creating special lanes for Thomas Bach and John Coates to travel in so they don't have to get caught in traffic, I would tell them, we're not building it. We're not building those roads. Uh, and it's going to, sorry, but it's going to take you an hour and a half to go from cluster A to cluster B. OK, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Shintaro Kano, Kyoto News. Um, I know you just said you haven't extensively researched Tokyo yet, but what do you think the cost overrun will be, even if it is ballpark for Tokyo? And do you think Tokyo can be that rare success story like Barcelona or LA, or will it go down the path of Athens or Rio? Well, in terms of cost overruns, I, I don't have any idea. I mean, right, we now, we now, According to the, the statistics that the Tokyo 2020 committee is sharing publicly, the initial bid was 5.6, and right now they're reporting 12.6, right? So we already know that they're more than double there. I would, if I wanted to understand the cost overrun potential, I'd want to take a very close look at the report that was done by the task force that was created by the Tokyo governor. Um, because again, they were, they were projecting a cost of $27.1 billion. 
that's a heck of a lot higher than 12.6 billion. So I don't know where in that range it's going to fall, but we, it, it seems pretty clear that the, at least there's, there's going to be a doubling of the costs. Uh, what, the second part of your question was... Whether it could be a success story like Barcelona. Oh, no. I, I, I'm, I'd be really surprised. Uh, it, it just does You don't have any of the ingredients for that. You know, in addition, Barcelona, in addition to doing the planning right, they had an enormous amount of support from the national government. They had support from the Catalan regional government. Uh, there was a very active involvement from the private sector. And probably most crucially, Barcelona was not a known tourist destination in Europe in 1992. Yet, it was a potential jewel. I don't know if anybody here has traveled to Barcelona, but once they opened up the city, it's just gorgeous. They have Gaudi architecture. They have a wonderful climate. They're on the Mediterranean. They've got their, the, the Ciudad Vieja with the, with the Picasso Museum, and, and people started discovering it. Now, people around the world who have the, the, the resources, the, the income, and have the interest to travel around the world, they already know about Tokyo. Tokyo is not going to be discovered after 2020. Um, Los Angeles won't be discovered. Paris won't be discovered. London wasn't discovered. That whole impact that the IOC loves to talk about is going to put your city on the map is a bunch of baloney, right? I mean, how can, you, how can you say to Los Angeles that the Olympics is going to, or Paris, or London, or, or Tokyo, that the Olympics is going to put you on the map? You're on the map. So I don't, I don't see any of e either on, on uh, a developmental basis or on a reputational basis any of the ingredients that were around in Los Angeles in 84 or um, in Barcelona in 92 that, that would rationally enable Tokyo to say this was good for our long-term development. I have a final question, perhaps. Have you ever been to uh, Olympic Games yourself? And if so, were you carried away by the spirit of the Olympics? And uh, do you plan to attend uh, Tokyo in 2020? <laughs> uh, no, I've never been to the Olympic Games. And I, I don't have much of a desire to go. I tend to watch them with my family on television, or at least, at least parts of them. Um, I, and I've, I've visited uh, host cities before the games and after the games, which I've done with, I did most recently with Rio. But I, um, I've, I find from people I've spoken to, both tourists and broadcasters and IOC people, that things get pretty crazy during the Olympics. I mean, one of the things that's going to happen in Tokyo is that you're going to have 17 days of lots of congestion and they're going to be lots of disruption of normal business. Lots of businesses are going to have to close down. Uh, in Rio, something like one-third of the businesses uh, closed down during the Olympic Games because workers, workers who normally would take an hour to get to work were taking two, two and a half hours to get to work. Beijing, as you know, closed down because they're afraid of pollution. Um, and for s several, several um, weeks or even months beforehand, they had an alternate day driving system. Um, so it's, and, and, and now, these days, the security issue is, is much, much more um, serious. So I don't have any strong desire to, to attend the Olympics live. And whether I come or not in 2020, I'll tell you in 2020. But it's, I, I wouldn't say it's likely that I'll be here. OK, well, on that note, we hope you will return to the FCCJ. We'd like to thank you for uh, your discussion today. It's very interesting. And uh, to entice you to come back, we have an honorary uh, membership to the club here. I'd like to oh, give great. you thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And I'd just like to note that Professor Zimbalist's uh, books that you see over on that end of the table all are available for sale at the front desk uh, here at the FCCJ. And thanks for coming.